We're going to look into God's word this morning into a subject that I think is sadly missing in most churches today. In fact, I've even heard it said that when a preacher preaches about sin, that that's negative preaching. Many other things have been said. Sin is my topic this morning. Sin is not preached, and if it is preached, in some circles it's taught that turning from sin is not required for salvation. And even that a Christian can cease believing and still be Christian. Here's another one that you might find interesting. Christians may fall into lifelong carnality, that is, living as a person who is unsaved, and they, uh, Christians can do that. Disobedience and prolonged sin are no reason to doubt one's salvation. Now, how in the world could biblical scholars come up with these ideas? It's amazing, isn't it? We don't want to run people off if we talk about sin. That's a current thought also. But folks, can I tell you, even before I get into the message this morning, God hates sin. Sin is an affront to God. Well, just in case you don't know what sin is, I'm going to give you a definition real quick. It seems like the human race is presented in Scripture is primarily a history of man in the state of sin and rebellion against God, and then God's plan of redemption to bring people back to himself. That's what the Bible is all about. So we can define sin as follows. Sin is any failure to conform to the moral law of God in act, attitude, or nature. Sin is defined in relation to God and his moral law. Sin consists not only of individual acts, such as stealing, lying, murder, those type of things, but it's also in attitudes. Now listen to me, it's also in attitudes. In fact, the Ten Commandments prohibit sinful actions, such as you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, his maidservant, his ox, his donkey, and so forth. Here God specifies that his desire to steal or to commit adultery is also sin in his sight. When we were born, we were born into sin. I'm going to get into that a little deeper in a few minutes. And I'm going to say this right here in the beginning. I'm going to say it again at the end. If there's anybody here this morning who is in, still in the natural state with sin in their lives and has never come to Christ for salvation, I pray that the Holy Spirit might use this message this morning to bring you to Christ. Before we were redeemed by Christ, not only did we do sinful acts and have sinful attitudes, we were also sinners by nature. So Paul can say from Romans 5, 8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Ephesians 2, 3. John tells us that sin is lawlessness, 1 John 3, 4. We should note that the definition that I'm giving you here emphasizes the seriousness of sin. Do you realize how serious sin is? We're told that we're to repent of our sins. Now, can I tell you that that's not a one-time thing? Because, why is it not a one-time thing? Because even as Christians, we go on sinning. We still, still have that flesh nature that we battle with. And when we sin, we are to confess our sins. The scripture says we confess our sins, and he is faithful to forgive them. 
So we should be living as Christians. If you're here and you're a believer, which I think most of you are, hopefully, then our life should be a, a, a time of repentance. Don't overlook that. Sin is serious with God. Now, how did sin originate? Where did it come from? Well, hopefully everybody really knows this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. First of all, God is not to be blamed for sin. He allowed it, but he did not cause it. Understand that. It was man who sinned, and it was angels who sinned. And in both cases, they did so by willful, voluntary choice. To blame God for sin would be blasphemy against the character of God. The scripture says in Deuteronomy 32, 4, His work is perfect, for all His ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and right is He. So He's not the author of sin. Job 34, 10 says this, A God of faithfulness, no, it says this, Far be it from God that He should do wickedness, and from the Almighty that he should do wrong. Job 34.10 In fact, it is impossible for God to even desire to do wrong. James 1.13 in fact says, God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. We must never think that sin surprised God though. It did not surprise him. We must never think that sin overcomes his omnipotence or his providential control of the universe. It's bad, but it does not overpower him. Even before the disobedience of Adam and Eve, sin was presence in the angelic world with the fall of Satan and the demons. But with respect to the human race, the first sin was that of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And that's found in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. Didn't take long in the scriptures for man to fall, did it? Can you imagine man was placed in that garden by God and everything, the environment and everything was perfect? Everything was perfect. He would have lived forever. But he was, Eve was tempted and then Adam partook of the forbidden fruit also. Well, how does the sin of Adam affect us? Scripture teaches that we inherit sin from Adam in two ways. Number one, we are counted guilty because of Adam's sin. In other words, we inherited this from Adam. And don't, I, I hope this never enters into your mind that you say that's not fair. Because if you were there, you would have done the same thing. How do I know that? Because we continue to do it. What Paul, I mean, what does we're saying here is that through the sin of Adam, all men sinned. All men sinned. Not some, all men sinned. That's what Mel just read a few minutes ago. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sin put man in a very precipitous place. We became, because of sin, we are, were enemies of God and His wrath rested upon us. That's a terrible position to be in, isn't it? The idea that God counted us guilty because of Adam's sin is further affirmed by Romans 5, 18 and 19 where it says this, listen. Then as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one man's act of righteousness leads to acquittal and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Glory, hallelujah. When Adam sinned, God thought of all who would descend from Adam, and they would all be sinners. 
as our representative, Adam sinned and God counted us guilty as Adam was. God counted Adam's guilt as belonging to us. And since God is the ultimate judge of all things in the universe, and since his thoughts are always true, God's, Adam's guilt does in fact belong to us. God rightly imputed Adam's guilt to us. After all, Christ's righteousness was imputed to us. We, we like that, don't we? We don't necessarily like the idea that Adam's sin was imputed to us. Same thing, it was. It's, in, it's inherited. Point number two about sin and its effect on us. We were counted guilty because of Adam's sin. Second, we have a willful nature because of Adam. We have a sinful nature because of Adam's sin. In addition to the legal guilt that God imputes to us because of his sin, we also inherit a sinful nature because of Adam's sin. Sometimes that's called original sin. That's a term that you hear often. Listen to what David had to say in Psalm 51, 5. This is his confession of his sin against, well, you know who it was against. I'll, I'll quote it here. Some have mistakenly thought that the sin of David's mother is in view here. But listen, he says in 51, 5 of Psalm, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. That's not talking about his mother's sin. David is confessing his own personal sin here. He went on to say this, Have mercy on me, God, O God. Blot out my transgressions, another word for sin. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, sin. I know my transgressions against you and you only have I sinned. David was so overwhelmed with the consciousness of his sin, he knew he had to make it right. He realized that he had a sinful nature. In fact, when he was born, he was brought forth from his mother's womb in iniquity. And even before he was born, he had a sinful disposition. He affirms that in Psalm 51, 5, where he said, In sin did my mother conceive me. He went on in Psalm 58, 3, The wicked go astray from the womb. They err from their birth, speaking lies. Therefore, our nature includes a disposition to sin. Before we were Christians, Paul said this, We were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind, Ephesians 2, 3. We were in a pitiful condition, folks, caused by sin. I'm going to say it again. Sin is serious. It is serious to God. All we have to do, too, is notice our little children when they're when they're born, it's not long before they're bickering and fussing, with the, particularly if they have other siblings. I want it. It's mine. How many times do you hear that? And you didn't teach them that. They were born with that. That's sin that they have. What you have to do as a parent, you have to teach them otherwise. You have to teach and, and raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Otherwise, they will get worse and worse and worse. And by the way, parents of little children, what you think is cute and funny today, when they reach those teenage years, that's not cute anymore. And you're going to have a battle on your hands to try to change them then. You need to be teaching them now the right way, not the sinful way. And the right way is God's way. <clears throat> 
Well, we're all born with that tendency to sin. The, inherit, the inherited tendency does not mean that we're all as bad as we could be. But it does mean that we can do no good in any sense of the word. Our tendency to sin, which we receive from Adam, means that as far as God's concerned, we're not able to do anything that pleases him. Not anything that pleases him. And this can be seen in two ways. First, in our natures, we totally lack spiritual good before God. There is none good, no, not one. It is not just that some parts of us are sinful and others are pure. And by the way, that's one of the, uh, the things that our culture has uh, adopted uh, too often. They're preachers and teachers who still think that there's some good in man. There never was, but they think there is some good. And they attest to that by saying that some good that is in them is what enabled them to be saved. Wrong. There is none good, not one. Paul said in Romans 7, 18, I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. And Titus 1, 15, to the corrupt and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Their very minds and consciences are corrupted. And you know what Jeremiah says about the heart. It's deceitful. It's wicked. It's corrupted. It's who can understand it, he said. You can't even understand your own heart. And yet today the, the current thinking is, is follow your own heart. That's a that's the worst advice you can give anybody. To follow your heart, because your heart is wicked. In these passages I just shared, Scripture's not denying that unbelievers can do some good as far as uh, some senses are concerned. But it is denying that they can do any spiritual good. That is, in terms of anything, any inner relationship that they might have with God. Apart from the work of Christ in our lives, we are like all others in unbelievers who, according to Ephesians 4.18, we are darkened in our understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. Ephesians 4.18. Now, second of all, in our actions, we're totally unable to do anything spiritual. Did you hear what I said? We're unable to do it. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.14 says that the natural man cannot receive spiritual things. He cannot receive spiritual things. We lack the ability to do anything that will in itself please God. We lack the ability to come to God in our own strength. Paul says in Romans 8.8, 8, those who are in the flesh cannot, cannot please God. Are you trying to please God by your efforts? Wrong. You cannot please God that way. And certainly an unbeliever has, a, it's a totally impossible for him to. An unbeliever is in a state of bondage and enslavement to sin. You realize that you, you could only do what your master, Satan, wanted you to do when you were an unbeliever. But praise God, when you came to him in faith, when you came to Jesus Christ in faith, you now swapped fathers. You now changed masters. You're now God's slave to do good, whereas you were Satan's slave doing only evil. That's a wonderful transition. And it was all wrought by God. He did it. No longer are we in the bondage of enslavement to sin. The scripture says when we were in sin, everyone who commits sin is a slave to it. 
When we were in that condition, we could not come to God in our own power. Jesus himself said in John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. Only way, folks. A lot of people out there advocating many ways to get to God. A lot of people out there advocating that everybody is going to get to heaven. That scripture talks about right there that no one comes unless he's drawn by the Father. And there's no other name under heaven given whereby a man may be saved except Jesus Christ. Don't you fall for some of these other ideas that have come along. Sad to say some great evangelicals of, of the past who were known as such great preachers. At the end it seemed like they came to the belief that everybody was going to heaven. Hogwash. The application to our lives is quite evident. If God gives anyone a desire to repent and trust in Christ, he should not delay. The scripture says now is the appointed time. You don't wait for tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Right? Tomorrow may not come. Well, just how bad is sin? Let me take it a little bit further. If it's been, as Mel so aptly pointed out, if it's been kind of bad news, let's go a little bit further with the bad news. Genesis 6, 5 says this, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great, and that every intent of his heart was only evil continually. We're talking about the extent of sin now. How bad is it? We've already mentioned what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Sin is a disease which pervades the... <laughs> when I say pervade, it just, it just runs through every part of our moral being and every faculty of our minds. Our understanding, listen, our understanding, affections, reasoning, powers, and will all are injected, are infected by sin. Even the conscience may be blinded. That's what led Isaiah to, to say this, from the sole of the foot even to the top of the head, there is no soundness about us. No soundness about us. The disease may be veiled under a thin covering of courtesy, politeness, good manners, but it's there. It's there. Man may have a grand and nobleness about him, about the faculties about him, his physical attributes, his skills, his great mental capacities, but spiritually he is utterly dead. No natural knowledge or love or fear of God. And remember, every part of the world bears testimony that sin is universe, it's a universal disease because all of mankind sin. It's rampant. It's everywhere. All people everywhere have always known how to sin. Everywhere the human heart is naturally <laughs> We reminded it's the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Further proof of the extent and power of sin. I said a little bit earlier about a newborn baby. But even after born again, when we are born spiritually again, we've been renewed, we've been washed, we've been sanctified, we've been justified. But the roots of sin still remain in us. It's a battle that we'll have until we see Jesus. John MacArthur said that's one of the great things about heaven. We'll no longer have that battle of sin going on. Maybe you don't have the battle. Really? Sin now as a believer... Scripture teaches us it no longer has dominion over us. 
before we were slaves to sin. But now as a believer, sin does not dominate us. If sin dominates your life, I would tell you, you need to examine yourself to see if you are truly a believer. If sin doesn't hurt, if it doesn't bother your conscience, you better check up. When we sin as a believer, it should grieve us just as it grieves our Heavenly Father. David realized he's, he sinned, but he, his, his confession said that against you and you only have I sinned. Now, of course, we know he sinned against Bathsheba, his wife. But the real sin was against God, and he understood that. There, as a believer, continues to be the fight between the flesh and the spirit. In fact, this shows and teaches us the enormous power that sin has. We must understand this. And we must have no confidence in the flesh, never forgetting to watch and pray, lest we too fall into temptation. I don't think that man realizes the exceeding sinfulness of sin in the sight of God. Did you hear what I said? I don't think that man realizes the exceeding sinfulness of sin in the sight of a holy God. Psalm 5, verses 4 and 5 says, You are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. You hate all workers of iniquity. Job 4.17, can a mortal be more righteous than God? Can a man be more pure than his maker? Psalm 7.11, God is angry with the wicked every day. But we, on the other hand, poor, blind, dead creatures, here today, gone tomorrow. We're born in sin, surrounded by sinners, we have no line to measure the awfulness of sin. By the way, God sets the standard. Man does not. God says this, sets the standard of what sin is and what it is not. We must settle firmly in our minds that sin is, quote, from Jeremiah 44, 14, we must, in our minds, Realize that the abominable thing that God hates is sin. He hates it. We must realize, according to Habakkuk 1.13, that God is of pure eyes than to behold iniquity and cannot look upon that which is evil. We must all realize that the least transgression... I think sometimes we as Christians wonder how, far, how close we can get to it and not be affected by it. But the least transgression of God's law makes us, according to Scripture, guilty of it all. James 2.10. The Scripture also says in Ezekiel 18.4, the soul that sinneth shall die. And as Mel read a few minutes ago, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. It's serious. The scripture says that there is a worm that never dies and a fire that is not quenched. Mark 9, 44. Psalm 9, 17 says the wicked shall be turned into hell. And on and on we could go about the seriousness of sin. We live in a society that thinks when you do something, it's, it's not so bad. Everybody's doing it. It's all right. I'm under grace now. I'm not under law anymore. Scripture says, so we go on sinning? God forbid, no. Grace does not give us the right to sin. Sin is deceitful. 
And this is what I was talking about. You may see the proneness of men to regard sin as less sinful and less dangerous. We're living in a culture that has adopted that kind of attitude now. It's only a little sin. We tend to compromise and rationalize away sin. It's, it's okay if I do this. Uh, let, me re, let me remind you that we are to flee from the very appearance of evil. Let me remind you that Christ said we are not to be a stumbling block to others. So the thing that you may see as being all right, and I'm not going to get off and, and chase that necessarily, but something that you may deem to be all right, if it could be a stumbling block in another person's life, you're not to do it. Sin is so terrible that nothing but the cross and the passion and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ could relieve us from this nature that we were born with. His substitution and atonement, his blood that he paid, the Son of God could make satisfaction to the Father through that shed blood, that atonement that he made for us. And not until Christ comes again shall we fully realize the sinfulness of sin. It's deceitful. It's deceitful. It's extremely subtle. We ignore the inevitable results of the love of money, prestige, worldly power, tampering with temptation. Sin is so subtle it never comes to you and says, hey, <laughs> I'm your enemy and I want to destroy you. It never comes that way, folks. I want to ruin you and cause you to go to hell. No, sin comes like Judas did. It comes with a kiss. Remember the forbidden fruit seemed good and desirable to Eve, yet it cost her Eden. She could have lived forever. Walking idly on his palace roof seemed harmless enough to David, yet it ended in adultery and murder. Sin rarely seems sin in its beginnings. Let us watch and pray lest we fall into temptation. Hebrews 3.13 says, Exhort one another daily lest any be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Let me read that again. Exhort one another daily, lest any be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. We must consider what guilty, vile, corrupt creatures we all are in the sight of God. And we are all in need of an entire change of heart. If that hasn't already taken place, that's what you need to do. We all had a cause to, to cry with the publican, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Let me ask you something. We just, we just don't hear the, the seriousness of sin to the point where when we're called to make a decision for Christ nowadays, <laughs> do you see anybody crying out for mercy anymore? Do we not understand that we needed mercy? We had to have his mercy for him to extend his grace to us. And yet it's, it just seems like when a person comes to Christ today, it's a ho-hum thing. I, I'm going to tell you something. I haven't been here that long in this church. But last Sunday morning is the first time I've seen anybody come down to this altar or this, these steps here and pray. But I saw Mel do it. Is he the only one in our congregation here 
that has a need. I don't know what his need was. We don't know, don't care. It's between him and God. Is he the only one in here? Oh, God, have mercy on us. Have we become so fearful of what man thinks about us that we don't come to the altar to pray? Are we ashamed of God? church I was previously in, it was a good church too. God was moving. Things were happening. One day the preacher was preaching. I've shared this with my Sunday school class. One day the preacher was preaching and right in the middle of the sermon, not at the end, right in the middle of the sermon, a lady up in the balcony. We had a church of about 2,000, 3,000 people. Our balcony was full. All downstairs is full. And this lady began wailing, crying out. And we could hear her as she started running and making her way down and ran down and fell on her face at the altar there in the church. And you know what all of us spiritual people did? <laughs> That's not in the altar of worship. What's she doing? So we qu someone quickly went down and ushered her out the side door. I'm not, I'm not anybody to be anything special, but I nudged my wife and I said, we might have just quenched the Holy Spirit. Revival, true revival, not, not a meeting that we planned. True revival may have broken out that very instant because of that person who saw her need to weep before a holy God and acknowledge her sin, I suppose. Others may, when you read about the great revivals that happened, they start that way. And others begin to do the same thing, confessing sin, confessing sin. His grace that he granted to us did not give us perfection forever in our Christian walk. We still sin and we ought to understand and realize that we hurt God when we do that. And we need to confess our sin. How deeply thankful we ought to be for the glorious gospel of the grace of God. Though sin has abounded, grace has abounded much more. Remember his power to save to the uttermost the chief of sinners. <laughs> Paul said he was, but I think I was. And most, uh, many of you could probably attest to the same thing. Thank God there is a remedy for this hideous disease called sin. No one needs to despair and faint if he will take a right view of Jesus Christ. We have become content with a lower standard of personal holiness. And I'm sure the Holy Spirit is grieved. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We do not love God as we ought to. to. We're to love him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We do not fear God as we ought to. We do not pray to God as we ought to. We give, we forgive, we believe, we live and hope imperfectly. Therefore, we must not be ashamed to confess our state of imperfections. By the way, people today call sin, we don't like to use the word sin. Remember I said that is a negative word. It's, it drives people away. If we talk about sin in our congregations today, people won't come back. Such nonsense as that. So we call sin shortcomings. <laughs> We, we flower it up a little bit. Shortcomings. Shortcomings, my eye, it's sin. It's an affront to God Almighty. So we must not be ashamed to confess 
our state of imperfections. We have neglected too long the daily practice of godliness. We must repent and return to the first principles. We must sit down humbly in the presence of God. Listen, we must sit down humbly in the presence of God, look at the whole subject in the face, and examine clearly what the Lord Jesus calls sin and what the Lord Jesus calls doing his will. We must realize that it is, a, it is terribly possible to live a careless, half-worldly life and yet maintain evangelical principles. Once we see the vileness of sin and how close it sticks to us, we should be led to get nearer to Christ. We should be led to drink more deeply out of His fullness and learn to live the life of faith in Him. As we learn this and abide in Him, we shall bear more fruit, find ourselves more patient in trials, be more watchful over our weak hearts, and more like Jesus in our daily ways. We'll realize how much Christ has done for us, and we'll labor to do much for Him. Much forgiven, much required. I'm convinced that the first step towards attaining a higher standard of holiness is to realize more fully the amazing sinfulness of sin. Let me remind you of what Mel read. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you're here today and you've never come to the, to the grips of how bad sin is, the worst thing about sin is it has separated you from God forever if you stay in that condition. If you're here in that condition or you're listening, please do not put off confessing your sin and repenting of your sin and crying out to God for mercy today. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to you as a congregation of hopefully majority believers who have confessed our sin. We, at some point in time, Father, your Holy Spirit convicted us and showed us the heinousness of sin. And we cried out for mercy and came to you. The only hope. The only hope. We came to Jesus Christ by faith. And we thank you, Father, for what you have done in accomplishing the salvation through Jesus Christ for us. Lord, I pray that we will never lose sight of how awful sin is in your sight. And that as believers, we still sin. Help us to face up to that, not rationalizing, not compromising, but owning up to our sin and confessing our sin to you. May we be a confessing, repenting people. Lord, may we understand that when we do sin, we offend you in the worst sort of way. Sin is so bad. Lord, help us never forget that it cost your son his life to redeem a sinful people. And for that, we are forever grateful. Thank you that you loved us so much that you did this. Thank you for the, what the Holy Spirit may have spoken to hearts today. We praise you and give you all the glory. In Christ's name I pray, amen.